this morning. His praise shall continuously be in our mouths. Amen? Worship him.
that's your declaration this morning that you have made it up in your mind that you will serve the Lord? Yes. Come on now. Is that your declaration this morning that you've made up your mind that you will serve the Lord? Just clap your hands and give God some glory.
sing it one more time. Your name is the greatest. Your name is the strongest. Your name it stands above them all. Oh, all thrones and yeah. all power. Say it again. Your your name is the highest. Your name is in the strongest and greatest. Your name it stands. All thrones and dominion, all power and positions. Your name stands above And the angels cry.
Just stand with hearts bowed, eyes closed, just a moment. Hands lifted if you choose. Feel that we just, I hate to use the word, but marinating in his presence. Just marinating in his presence. Soaking us through all the way to the deepest of our spirit. Your name is the highest, Lord. Your name is the greatest, Lord. Your name stands above them all. Father, thank you for your spirit that doesn't leave us and forsake us and abandon us when, when we make the wrong turn and when we are like sheep who've gone astray. You'll leave the 99 and come find us because you care about us. I, I, Lord, I pray that everyone in the room and everyone listening in today who've joined us Online, either now or even a later time as they're going back to it. I pray they would sense in this moment that they are loved by you. Someone has spoken condemnation over them. Some have spoken guilt over them. Some even have damned them, told you to damn them. But Father, they're not damned nor condemned. They're forgiven and pardoned and cleansed. They are loved by you. They are sought by you. Father, I pray in this moment that realize their worth. And take what you've given them, return it to you and say, Lord, you are holy and you're righteous and you're blessed and you're glorious. You're the greatest and the highest. And we honor and exalt you today. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Say hello to two or three people before you sit down today. Good morning. Is Ruby in the house today? Yes. Ruby's back. Don't run a race with her. She'll, she'll beat you. She got a knee replacement. That's, she's not quite ready. Well, oh, well, you're here. Thank God you're here. Sister Ruby, good to have you. Good to have you back in your, in your place. Jory and Chrissy tried to hold it down for you over there. They sat there and felt the anointing while you were gone. Uh, if you're at home,
and would like to join us uh, with uh, the sharing and partaking of communion. We're going to do that later in the service, and so if you want to get uh, your elements at home ready to, uh, to join us, um, any time in here is a good time. I tell you, the good flow of the good flow of the uh, of the spirit is is with us uh, among us. Um, if you're in the room, you have a bulletin probably. If you'll turn to the the, the back of it, I have a. <clears throat> we're going to pick up where we start, uh, where we finished, or didn't finish last week. Ever how you look at that? We started a series titled "Go for the Gold," coinciding with the Olympics. <clears throat> E pluribus unum, <clears throat> and also with the, uh, that, that's, that, that sounded, sounded good. It's, uh, I, I, I thought the angel, and the angel sing. <clears throat> we had everything but the stained glass a while ago, man. I tell you, it was good. <clears throat> uh, the, the Olympics have gone from marathon and wrestling which may have been close to their original intent, to break dancing and ribbon twirling. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> so that's a reminder, listen, that's a reminder to us that the original vision of a business, a service organization, a church, or life can easily drift from what its original intent was as we, if we don't keep repeating the vision, if we don't keep talking about this is why we're here. That's why uh, Vince Lombardi went back to the Green Bay Packers after a tough season and said, guys, we're going to start the basic. This is the football. Let's talk about the football. Uh, and sometimes we have to go back and renew the vision. Why are we talking about those, th those things again? Uh, We've we got to keep renewing the vision, which is what Nehemiah did halfway through in our story last week. Um, but I thought, you know, if they've got ribbon twirling and they've got break dancing and let the Australia girl in, um, what if wall building was an Olympic event? Um, I mean, they got most everything else. And I thought, well, what nations would be good at that? Well, China probably have to put an entry in there with their Great Wall. Uh, Germany at one point. The U.S., we're trying. Uh, depend on... <laughs> Depends on who the, con who the president is at the time. Uh, you know, I thought last week, uh, sorry for the political uh, uh, take on it, but I thought last week when Nehemiah said, I'm going to go build the wall at Jerusalem, and I want your government to pay for it. He said, I thought, well, that's, that's a good, good way to work it. Um, we were using the, uh, we didn't finish sharing our five uh, things that destroy focus. They're not the exhaustive list. The fact that phone's not on there ought to tell you it's not a complete list. But uh, what destroys our focus in our life, in our personal mission, in our church mission, uh, in, in any great mission for any organization, including your home and marriage, what, what destroys the focus of this is why we're here, this is what we're trying to accomplish. And we were using the example of Nehemiah as a leader who had gone back to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, I, I certainly don't want to repeat and recover everything I talked about last week, or I won't get finished again. <clears throat> but I do need to say a few things about Nehemiah and his project. He's one of the greatest examples, models to me, of leadership in the Bible. And I hope you can grasp the importance of our focusing on the finish line. Go for the go, as Paul talked about in Corinthians and, 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 and in Hebrews. Uh, let's, let's forget what's behind, let's press for the prize. Uh, as, we, as we're seeking to live out God's plan and God's purpose for, for our lives. So we were in Nehemiah, and I think we, we got to chapter 4, and, and, and so let me, we're going back to chapter 4, I'm going to read a, a number of verses that we didn't read last week. Uh, but let me give you a very brief uh, explanation of how we got here, and then, and then we'll uh, read some verses. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. That had become his job. He was a cupbearer to the king, the Persian king, Artaxerxes. Decades earlier, the Babylonians had come in, had conquered, besieged, and conquered Israel and reduced Jerusalem, which is the same uh, city as we have today, Jerusalem, to, to rubble. Uh, and then, if you remember... Um, there was a night when Belteshazzar saw the writing on the wall, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Eupharsin, Daniel says, that's God is 
God has, you've been found, uh, you've been weighed in God's balances and found wanting. And, and the Medes and Persians are coming in and they're going to they're gonna knock down your kingdom and it's not going to stand anymore. And that very night, the Bible said the Medes and Persians came in and overthrew the Babylonian Empire. So, <clears throat> Nehemiah is one of those from the descendants from Jerusalem, but he's now a cupbearer to the Persian king. And, and, and so he comes in one day, he's unhappy. The king asks, why are you unhappy? And he said, I just got a burning desire in my heart to go back. My, my, my hometown, my people are just down, the morale's low, and, and it's, it's, it's just a disaster. There's a malaise, if I can use the word, that's on the place. And God's put it in my heart to go back. And, and you know, the king said, man, what you need to do it? How long is it going to take you and what do you need? And, and he pulled out his list and, and, he, and, and he was ready. He had, done, he had prayed about it and done his homework. Listen, you pray and do your homework. That'll get you a lot of places in life. Now, he, he wanted to see Jerusalem rebuilt and, and reflourish, but he knew that it, it began with building a wall. It wasn't the only thing that was needed, but it was a necessary first step. And even though he had the blessing of the king, he rendered some fierce opposition. It began in chapter 2, uh, and the names Sanballat and Tobiah are, um, are brought out. They, we said last week they weren't happy because he was doing something that promoted the good welfare of the people of Israel. And, and so we go to uh, chapter 4. Let me, let me read a little bit. Now, I may interrupt a little. I'll try not to do much, but... It says, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He said, last week, not everybody's going to be happy when you're doing good things. Not everybody's going to celebrate you, rejoice. In fact, some people are going to try to slow it down, impede your progress, or stop things completely. Now, why was he angry? Greatly incensed. Well, it's because just... It's, it's the age-old answer. He felt that these guys coming in, it was a threat to his control. He had a power base. He had things operating. And, and I want to tell you something. If you haven't learned this, you'll learn it in life if you open your eyes. There's a lot of people trying in everything you're trying to do, in your business, in a church, in a city, in a nation. The, there are people trying to get control of things that shouldn't be under their control. In, in fact, well, I don't want to go too far down this, but let, let me say to you, the issue that most people raise in life is never, it, it's almost never the issue. What people are making the big issue, that's not the issue. The issue is control. And they're using, oh, can't believe that they're using the issue in order to get control. Just I, let me get current with you for a moment. I think I can say this without getting too political. President Biden's health issues weren't the real issue why he was pressured to step down and not run again. You understand that? I'm not saying he didn't have health in, health issues, health insurance, health issues. It was about control. If he had been up in the post and nobody going to rock the boat, they're going to go along with whatever. They, they, oh, he's fine, sharp, focused, everything's fine with him. But the issue, listen folks, the issue is rarely the issue. When you hear somebody making a big issue, it's because they're trying to get control. And the same thing can happen, the same thing can happen in a church, it can happen in a family. I've seen people get worked about issues and and work of others about issues. And the issue wasn't the issue. The issue was about control. And so he gets greatly incensed. He ridicules the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he says, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? In other words, they're, they're, they're going to they're gonna get religious on us before you know it. Are they going to finish in a day? Nobody said we're going to do this in a day. But they began to put the bar of expectation here, and then mock the people. Can they, can they bring these stones back to life from these heaps of rubble burned as they are? They begin to talk about how bad the situation was, and, and what are they going to do? 
Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, Ah, yeah, what are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. A mockery uh, suggesting that there's uh, inferior craftsmanship and workmanship. They, they don't know what they're doing, and this is going to fall down if a fox walks on it. Now, I, I really almost like to leave out this part, the next verse or two, because it's the prayer of Nehemiah, and, and just kind of an aside prayer. And... It's not the prayer we as leaders really are taught that we're supposed to pray. Maybe the Old Testament allows them to pray it. But, you know, instead of turning the other cheek, his basic, it says, Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over to plunder in the lab. Get them, God, basically is what he said. And, and let me tell you a difference that, that I see. And, and you know, maybe, maybe you don't see this. I'm just, I'm just talking to you out of my heart for just a moment while I'm trying to read through this. Um because I don't have anything written down here on it. This is, just, this is just from here. It's difficult as a leader, when you're in charge of a church or an organization, uh, a corporation, you have to separate when people are attacking you and when they're attacking the organization. Um, you know, I... I've let people insult me and say things about me, and you just take it. You know, you just realize there, there are things that people are going to say. Everybody's going to have human moments. And, and if, if I chase down every negative word that everybody, I, I heard rumored that somebody said, I wouldn't get anything done in life. And, and in fact, I don't like it when they insult my wife and insult my kids. I get a little more, I bristle a little bit more, but if you're going to lead, you're going to realize you're going to have some of that. But when I really get really change my attitude is when I see them attacking, and, and I'm not responding to anything. There's, I don't have a sword with me or my gun or anything. We're, we're, not in a, we're not in some church struggle. I don't mean to indicate that. But I've pastored for many decades, so I'm talking out of life experience. <clears throat> when they go after the flock, now, now I've got a, you know, it's not just, well, you know, it's okay, God will take care of them. It's no, you got to defend the flock against the wolves. And, and sometimes when you're standing, people see that defense of the flock or what you've been given instruction and responsibility to protect and oversee as though, well, you got a bad spirit. You respond in the flesh. And, and so Nehemiah, it isn't just, well, you're talking about me. Nehemiah's got a task that God has given him and, and he's being attacked and, and he realizes if he doesn't do something, it's going to affect. And so I just, let me just stop and say, give grace to people who are in leadership, whether they're a president or a governor or a pastor or a police chief, because sometimes they have to deal with things that you don't know about. And, and, and so give them a little, show them a little grace like you would want, be wanting to show grace. Does that, does that make any sense to you? But Nehemiah realizes, you know, I'm not. We we we've got to keep doing what we what God's called us to do. We can't quit. And but the people are going to be disappointed. God, I need your help. Take care of them for us. Do something to help us here. Now, then he keeps on. So we rebuilt the wall. He didn't just pray. They kept working. Okay, we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart. So we're halfway there. And it, anytime you get halfway there. You tend to bog down because the first half sometimes goes easier than the second half. The finish can be tough. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. What they had intended to slow down and stop, the work didn't, didn't work. They, they all plotted together to come and fight Turn physical now against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard. Yeah, you know, I love it. faith without works is dead. Well, we prayed to God and we posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said the strength of the laborers is giving out and there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. And this is where we stopped, although we didn't read all that text last week. We spoke of fatigue as being something that causes us to lose focus. We're, the strength is giving out. We get tired. We get weary. And, and I, I gave you the scripture in 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 and 13. It says, But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. 
Now, I, I do believe that when you are functioning and flowing in your calling, that there's an anointing that helps you in what you're doing. But I think it's a, it's a well-intentioned but incorrect idea that if we're doing the right thing, we won't wear out, we won't burn out, we, we won't get tired and weary. And that's just not true. The Word says, don't be weary in well-doing. You can be doing the right thing and doing it well, and, and you still need to rest every now and then. Fatigue it will, it will get you. And, and so there's a, there's a saying, it's not a, a verse in here, but there's a saying that, that don't make decisions, major decisions, when you're tired. And I think there's wisdom in the words, let me sleep on it not just procrastinating, let me sleep on it. Because right now I'm a little tired and I might make it, but let me sleep on it. And after a little rest, and my mind uh, uh, being able to take a moment to, to, to rest and not respond in my weariness, I, I may have a better answer. So in verse 10, after they say the strength is giving out, I want you to know it's the next focus. We were talking about the power of focus. The next focus shifts from the work that's completed to the rubble and they felt overwhelmed and there is so much work so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall would you agree with me that the pile of problems seems bigger when you're exhausted seems bigger don't think we can do it the third thing that I want to tell you is a focus destroyer and they all flow together but it's it's something we're familiar with. It's called frustration. Anybody ever been frustrated? Okay. Some of you haven't. <clears throat> Most of you have. Uh, you ever feel like the more that you do, the more there is left to do? You try to take care of something that's... <sighs> insurance. You're dealing with an insurance claim. And, and you think, well, I just spent an hour with them on the phone. That ought to take care of it. And, and, and two days later, yeah, it hadn't changed at all. And you have to go back, and, and you, you don't talk to the same person, but they sound like they're in the same room with them. You know? And, and you can hear the little chatter going in the back, and you're like, can you send me up to somebody else? Let me, who, who, if, who's the person above you that you hand off to? And finally, you, and you get, well, you ever been frustrated by that? Yeah, when you, you, you feel like, well, like, the more I do, the more there is left to do. Now let me ask you this very personal question. Don't answer me out loud. What's the rubble in your life? What's the rubble in your life? Is it some static in a speaker? What's the rubble in your life? A, a, a messy divorce, a lawsuit, an insurance claim that isn't being handled right? I... I, I I think when life isn't going the way that we planned, it's easy to get frustrated. And I would say that for most of the people in here, life isn't going the way you exactly planned. Maybe, for not, maybe not for anybody. But I know that halfway through a project or a task, we're going to be tempted to quit. Now here's one of the things I've learned about frustration. It's not the only uh, avenue of, of uh, uh, feeling better through it. But I've learned I can go through almost anything if I know how it's going to turn out. That's why it's good to have a picture of the end result, and let's move toward it. If, if you see people watching the uh, 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 football game, it's about kickoff season again. Buford, they're on the edge of the sea. You're a Florida fan. Um, if, if your team, is, if your team is, is down and it's the last quarter and the last drive, you don't have to worry if this is a rerun and you know how it turns out. If this is a replay of last year's bowl game, it doesn't matter if they fumble on the one yard line. It's okay because just wait a while. I know what's going to happen. And, and, and so the good news about it is for all of us who are believers is when we're going through all this stuff in life, there's one thing we know. We know how it, hap how it finishes at the end. We know this. All things work together for the good of those who love God. Everything's not good by itself. But together, all things will work together. God will make it all work together for the good of those who love Him. Do you love Him? Are you the called according to His purpose? I am. You are. So when you're in a situation that doesn't look like God's promise to you, 
realize, okay, this is not it. This is temporary. Where I am doesn't mean this is where I'm going to end up. You know, Joseph had this dream. His brothers were bowing down to him. And it wasn't, but just a short time later, he's looking up because they throw him in a pit. I don't think Joseph despaired because this doesn't look like my dream. Is it long before he ends up in a prison? I, you know, he's bothered, but he's not overwhelmed with frustration because this isn't the dream either. But when he gets to Pharaoh's palace, I think he walks in and says, you know, I think this may be what I saw in the dream. And his brothers come in and all bow down. He's like, guys, this, I mean, you know, inside, this is it. And so if you're, if you're in your pit or if you're in your prison, listen to me. Wherever you are, if this is not matching God's promise to you, keep moving, keep going. Don't stop because of frustration. You know, I think that's why Paul, the Bible doesn't say this, but this is my take on it. Paul, remember when he was in the shipwreck, Acts 28, and, and they, they landed on the island of Melita, and they're picking up sticks, and a serpent comes out of the uh, fire and fastens on his hand, and, and he shook it off in the fire. And everybody around there seemed to uh, feel like, ooh, this is bad, except Paul. And I think the reason for it is God had given him the word that you must stand before Caesar. And on that word he stood. And when the poisonous snake bit him, I don't care what kind it is, it bit me. It might as well have been a King Diamondback Cobra python or whatever. You know, it's all the same. It didn't bother him. Because I think he looked around at the islanders who were all looking at him. The Bible said they were all looking at him. He didn't see Caesar. God's not finished with me yet. It doesn't matter what it looks like now. No need getting frustrated because this is not what God told me was coming. And, and, and so I, let me just, just encourage you again. Don't stop where you are because, well, this is God promised me this and this is where I am. You keep serving God with what you have where you are. You serve, the Bible says you be faithful in little things, and God will give you other things to, to be brought into your life, to be a steward over. You, you be faithful where you are. You, you do what you have with what you, what you can with what you have. And watch God. The Bible says he will exalt you in due season. And because it hasn't happened, you may should have got that promotion at work. It may should have been yours. You may have been passed by. You, you're probably right. But that's okay. There's a God who sees and a God who knows. He has a time. Serve Him and trust Him. And let God do what God wants to do in His time. All things will work together for good. Let me give you a fourth thing that is a destroyer of our focus. And that is, and it's the feeling that comes out of frustration... It's the feeling of failure. We can't do it, they said. We can't. We tried, but let's just face it. We can't do this. And one of the reasons is because they, they, they were unable to finish as quickly as, as they had planned. Um, and sometimes that's the leader's fault. I, I'm, I've been blessed uh, uh, as a pastor to lead a congregation in ministry through some major projects and growth. And, and number one, it, it's the job, sometimes it's the fault of a leader to say, hey, we're going to do this, and it sounds like, well, let's just go out and do it, and then it takes a while because you have setbacks, and you begin to bog down, and, 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 and everything doesn't move as fast as you'd like it to move. It's just not all happening as quick. You can do that with a football team or with a business it just it takes a, it takes some energy to make it come together, and it doesn't always happen just like it worked on paper. And so, yeah, we suffered some setbacks along the way. Yeah, I remember some times that 
you know, things just happen. I, I remember one, one Sunday when we started, uh, we started a branch church. We didn't intend to. It just happened. You know, they just, folks got together and decided we were going to do that. And so, uh, yeah, that was kind of a tough time. You know, it's like, okay, God, what's next? But listen, um, I, think it's, I think it's good of me to be able to say to you and say to my children, say to my grandchildren, God's got, God's got a plan for you. Now listen, I, I love when I'm, I meet a child for the first time and maybe he's a, I, I, I've been to some pastors and their, their kids, grandkids came up and, uh, you know, they're, they're seven, eight years old and, you know, I look at them and you see, man, you just see there's anointing in his life. Uh, you can tell they've got some potential in them and I, and I love telling them that. Son, you, you've got some real potential. Man, you can do some great things for God. You can do some really incredible things with your life. God's called you to be a, I don't know what he's called you to be, but you're going to be good at it. You're going to be really good at it. And you know, sometimes a word like that's a seed that just, that's all, and they, they remember those words a long time. But let, listen, 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 let me tell you the other angle. Sometimes I think it's healthy for me to tell my grandkids, you're going to fail some in life. You're going to make some mistakes. Because nobody I know has an unbroken string of, string of successes. And how you handle your knockdowns is going to be just, if not more important, than how you handle your moments of accolades and success. Your win how do you handle your losses? you got a professional baseball player. What are they, what's a, what are they bad? What's their average? 300 pretty good. 300 is a pretty good average for a baseball player. You know what that means? Seven out of ten times they come up to bat, they go back to the dugout with an out. You're not going to hit a grand slam every time you get up, but you keep getting up. You keep showing up. You keep doing what God's called you to do. And and I just think it's healthy to say. Having, having failures in your life, that isn't the issue. The issue is, are they going to control you? How are you going to handle them? Are you going to let them define you? And when you're tempted to give up, which is how they felt in, in Nehemiah 4, that's when you need to redouble your efforts and say, somehow, God, you're going to have to help us, and we're going to, we're going to do what needs to be done. We're going to get this thing done. That's where they were. Let, let me give you the fifth thing that shuts down. And it'll shut your focus down just like that. It's real simple. It's called fear. It's called fear. And, and when fear comes along, you forget what you're supposed to do because that feeling just takes over you like a toothache, shuts down your body. <clears throat> here's, here's, what, here's how the Living Bible reads uh, 10 and 11. Then some of the leaders began complaining that the workmen were becoming tired and there was so much rubble to be removed that we could never get it done by ourselves. Meanwhile, as if it weren't bad enough, our enemies were planning to swoop down upon us and kill us. I love the next line. And kill us, <clears throat> thus ending our work. Isn't that the kind of employee you want? They're going to kill us. And you know what that means? We won't be able to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> that's, the, that's the kind of guy you're looking you, That's the kind of guy you want to hire. Worst thing about killing is that we can't finish our job. <clears throat> Fear is a focus destroyer. When Peter took his eyes off Jesus and began to look at the wind and the waves, he became afraid and he began to sink. And I've seen people that are in this situation where God's called them to do something, but they feel fear. They feel like, I can't. And you know what? When that's what you say, that's the way it is. But if you can say, through Christ, I can do all things. 1 Timothy 1 and 7 says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Did you hear that today? 
God has not given you and I the spirit of fear. He has given us the spirit of, of power and of love and a sound mind. And 1 John 4 and 18 says, There's no fear in love, for perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Now, when we think about taking communion, we think about our life. I mean, we're, we're, we're on this journey of life. We're, we're trying to do our best. We're not perfect, but you know what? We keep showing back up. We keep coming back to the moment of worship and the place of His presence. And we ask God to change us and ask God to transform us. Make me better today, Lord. Let me leave here better than I came. Help me be a witness in a light this week. And then the feelings of failure and the feelings of frustration and the feelings of fear and fatigue hit us. This is the answer. In His presence, at His table, there's rest. His perfect love cast out all fear. If you're weary, come to Him. If you're frustrated, stand right here with me on a Sunday morning while we're singing and the angels cry, holy, holy, holy forever. You are lifted high. And in that moment, all the frustrations and all the stuff I've dealt with, it's gone. It's melted away. And I know only Him. Here at the table of the Lord, there's healing. Here at the table of the Lord, there's forgiveness. Here at the table of the Lord, there's cleansing and there's renewal. We may feel like Nehemiah and his team, weary in what we're doing. But God says to you today, as he, as he, as he told us through Paul, be not weary in well-doing. So I want us to come to the table today. We're going to take a moment and... And if you would, uh, let's stand across the room. I'm going to ask God to help us discover the spiritual health. Cure, Lord, take away our feelings of failure. I'm not good enough. And know that I have been made to be something new in Christ. And that He is making all things new. He is, we are being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And in this moment, let's just let's focus on His goodness and His grace before we partake of the elements of communion. Let's just be reminded of what He did for us and the strength He gives us on this journey. Amen. going to take today the bread. Is there anyone who hasn't received the communion elements? If, if so, lift your hand and someone will bring those to you. Okay. We take the bread. We're reminded today, Lord, that this is a representation of the body that was broken. May we find strength today at your table. May those who are weary, those who feel 
they have fallen and failed, may they find peace and forgiveness in this table of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of Calvary. Let us partake the bread. Father, we remember we remember now we partake let the weak say I am strong let the poor say I am rich let the fallen say, I am restored. Let the broken say, I'm healed. Let the weary say, my strength is being renewed. One moment more, you can take a hand of a person next to you. One of the things that the table of the Lord does, it brings us together in unity as a family. So as a family of believers, and it may not be blood kin that's next to you, but I want to tell you, that's a sister next to you. That's a brother next to you. Maybe your life companion, but I want to tell you, that's somebody that's got your back right there. Sometimes we don't always feel like that with one another, but by the blood of Jesus and the, the family of God and our family is brought together, united. Father, would you melt away everything, whether it's between husband and wife, brother and sister, make us whole. Let us be united in purpose and thought. Let us be surrendered to your will. Father, would you bless our congregation, the people who call this home? Would you bring those who are supposed to be with us, Lord? We, we ask that you anoint us to go out and bring them in. Your house may be filled. Father, we pray for our community. We pray for our state for our nation father that you would you would anoint and bring to, into place the position the leaders that will 
seek you and honor you, that it might be well for us as a people. Your kingdom come, Lord. May your will be done. In Jesus' name. bless you today. I, I, I love you. I hope you feel loved by, by us and by him and by those around you. You're dismissed today. God bless you. Go in his peace.